All right, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Fantastic. I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. And I would obviously like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional territory of the Mascam's people, Mascam peoples, and recognize that you are joining us today from many lands whose ancestral caretakers deserve our respect and admiration. Uh, it is really my pleasure and honor as well to, in this historic day, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this historic day, to officially launch the Teaching and Learning Lunch Seminar Series. Uh, this project was conceived during pandemic time, so it was delayed a bit, uh, to become a counterpart of the research seminar series that have uh, been so successful in, in our faculty in, for, for many years. Uh, the idea may have circulated before, but it's only now that we have uh, more people that are lecturers and professors of teaching that we feel that we have a critical mass to make these events happen. And uh, I would like to thank many colleagues who worked hard to make this project a reality in, in no particular order. First, our Dean Rob Kozak. Uh, for his enormous, immediate, and unconditional support for the teaching and learning seminar series. Those are three uh, really accurate words to describe that. Uh, Sarah Gergel, Associate Dean Academic, and Nicholas Coops, head of the Forest Resources Management Department, were really supportive as well and provided really good ideas. Uh, Tarne Solati, Associate Dean of Research and Innovation, uh, she graciously allowed some of the slots that were devoted to the research seminar series to the now teaching and learning seminar series. So that was uh, really nice. Um, uh, Karen Horry, uh, if you're here, uh, raise your hand. Uh, and uh, Steph Trofton uh, for uh, making the event happen with, with support, superb logistical organization and what I would call uh, marketing magic. Uh, Michelle Seng <laughs> and her team for their technological miracles. Uh, Fabian Lozano for his invaluable work with registration and other crucial tasks that happen behind the scenes to produce an event like this. Uh, Paul Piquel for being so brave to delight us with the very first talk of the series. Uh, similarly, Sarah Barron, uh, Carlin Brooks. Carlin, I thought you were here. I, I saw her a bit a while ago. Um, and Paul Piquel himself for becoming the founding members of the TLSS. So we get together and talk about organization of the event and, and so on. Uh, my TA is Nick Green and Walter Young for their, their help setting up the room today. And most importantly, all of you, the attendees, uh, because if you did not sign up, this uh, event would make no sense whatsoever. So thank you for being here. It's really appreciated. You may have read in the recent invitations that the, the teaching and learning seminar series will feature extraordinary house, in-house, and external speakers highlighting teaching and learning experiences or pedagogical research at UBC and other places. We hope to get some people from other universities, maybe international at some point. And our goal is to alternate up to three teaching and learning series events with the research seminar series for a total of eight events per year uh, between September and May uh, of each year. Our next uh, events will be on March 14th. I'm talking about the teaching and learning seminar series uh, with uh, Carlin Brooks speaking on that occasion. And on May 16th, uh, Sarah Barron will uh, delight us with a talk. Uh, details are, are still in progress. Uh, in these events, we hope to encourage an interactive participation from the public surrounding the speaker's presentation. So there will be time at the end for questions. And uh, today, Paul will. Um, help you interact uh, in, this, in this topic, uh, and then have uh, an opportunity to open wider discussions about education in forestry and beyond, and undergraduate instruction in general. Um, it is then my honor to introduce you to the very first speaker, Dr. Paul Piquel, with his talk titled, uh, Minecraft Forestry, Engaging Students with Video Game Pedagogy. Uh, Dr. Paul Piquel is an assistant professor of teaching in the Department of Forest Resources Management and a registered professional agrologist in British Columbia. He received his PhD in forestry from UBC in 2015 and worked as a postdoctoral research and teaching fellow at UBC until 2018. 
He then led a research program to use artificial intelligence to predict wildfire threats in BC as a research scientist at the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. It's a really long <laughs> name. So I don't it. come up with them. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Piquel teaches courses in geomatics and has led the development of new GIS and remote sensing courses on the, at the undergraduate and graduate levels. He currently serves as the acting director for the Masters of Geomatics for Environmental Management, the MGEM program uh, here in this faculty. He is the editor of Geomatics for Environmental Management, an open textbook for students and practitioners, and has authored uh, numerous peer-reviewed papers on the in his field. He also serves as an academic editor of the for the editorial board of Plus One. His current research involves the development of immersive immersive virtual reality, augmented reality, and web-based mapping applications for teaching geomatics. He recently collaborated with the Center for Advanced Wood Processing to design and build uh, UBC's first augmented reality sandbox. He is the principal investigator of the gamification of forestry project, which aims to develop a comprehensive digital twin of UBC Vancouver campus and UBC's research forests for teaching and learning in a virtual reality. Pretty impressive. Uh, Dr. Pickel will discuss some of the benefits today of teaching with video games, introduce the gamification of forestry project, and share some of uh, uh, the recent examples of teaching with MindTest. This is a free open resource software clone of the popular Minecraft, Minecraft voxel-based sandbox video game. My nephew is addicted to that thing. Uh, we hope you brought your PC or Android device to play along. So without further ado, Paul, thank you so much. A round of applause. Thank you, Andres. And um, I'm very honored to inaugurate this teaching learning seminar series. I hope that more Folks will come forward and uh, and take this as an opportunity to present your own uh, interests and things that you're doing that are really cool and innovative in forestry in our faculty with regards to teaching. Um, I'm also very excited to talk about this project that I've been working on for a little bit more than a year now. Um, and my talk, as uh, as Andrew had already pointed out, is about Minecraft forestry uh, using a free and open source software version of that uh, called MindTest. So I'm going to. Um, talk about some of the challenges and the benefits that uh, we we know about in terms of teaching with video games. And then I'm going to share my own experiences recently with teaching with video games, um, and then uh, lessons learned from that. And then, and then finally, I'll conclude by introducing uh, the gamification of forestry project that Andres had mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, so just a quick poll. How many people in here, by a, row, by a show of hands, I'm not gonna call on you. I'm not asking if you identify as a gamer, but raise your hands if you've ever played a video game. Okay, let the record reflect that that was like 90% or plus of people in the room. Um, okay, now how many of you have ever taught with a video game or been in a classroom where a video game was used to teach something, show of hands. Okay, so I could probably count the number of people on my hands for those of you playing along on Zoom. Um, so that little poll is a really great example of what we already know about uh, video games in the literature. A lot of people play video games. The uh, an overwhelming majority of people play video games. Very few people actually teach with video games or have ever been taught using a video game. Um, and this becomes especially more apparent with the higher education segment. So of the folks that report teaching with video games in the literature, only about a third of those uh, are at the higher education level. So we have a large skew towards early childhood education, uh, pre-kindergarten through 12, uh, grade 12, uh, with just a few applications in industry and training. So that's a little surprising because so many people play video games. And if we look at the history of video games, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but over the last 50 years, the size of the video game industry has grown a lot. So a lot of people are playing video games today on a lot, a lot of different uh, platforms and formats and types of games. Um, the market of video games, this is in 2020. These are adjusted to $2020, US dollars. Uh, was $165 billion uh, just a few years ago. 
And uh, it's hard uh, to understate how big of an impact, how large this industry really is, uh, because it's larger than movies and other entertainment uh, industries. Uh, it's bigger than Hollywood. Um, it, it's very, very large. And I don't think people really appreciate how large it's gotten. As well, we know from, uh, from research, the literature, that video games have a lot of positive benefits in the classroom. So for example, uh, these are a list of the different types of benefits that are found uh, in all of the published literature. This was uh, 10 years ago. So if you imagine on that diagram, moving back 10 years uh, in the pri prior slide, uh, the main learning benefits that we see from game-based learning or video games uh, is affective and motivational, which I don't think that should be too surprising. Video games are really engaging. Um, students who play video games in classrooms, you know, report or have a high positive regard for them. Um, there's also a lot of knowledge acquisition and content understanding. That's the second most commonly reported uh, benefit, and that hopefully should come as no surprise when you use video games in a classroom setting that people are learning something and going away with a better understanding of, uh, of a concept. Um, and there are also, depending on the type of video games and the situation, I mean, there's other things like per perceptual, cognitive skills, um, you know, being able to have visual cues, auditory cues, reaction times, this kind of thing, uh, behavioral changes in terms of like attitudes, habits of people. Uh, those can also be impacted positively by video games. Few papers have shown uh, physiological outcomes and social soft skill outcomes like uh, teamwork, communication, and that kind of thing. There we go. Okay, so those are some of the benefits. Some of the challenges, I mean, if we know that there's a lot of people playing video games, we know that there's, some, there's a lot of really good uh, benefits from playing video games in a teaching context. What's holding us back? Um, well, there's a number of stigmas, I think, that are out there in terms of uh, being able to adopt video games in a professional setting. Uh, video games are only for young people, uh, despite the fact that we have an entire industry that's dedicated to adult gaming, which is also quite substantial. We have entire arcades and buildings that are dedicated only for adults. Um, another commonly, uh, I think, common uh, misperception is that video games uh, are only for entertainment value, that uh, they have uh, no other value outside of entertainment, and that they're just a waste of time. And maybe for the adult gaming segment, that's true. Um, but there are a lot of video games now, um, and even in recent history, that have been developed specifically for teaching. Um, Minecraft being one example that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, Oregon Trail maybe being another good example of a video game that was developed specifically for teaching. So. Nowadays, we do have video games that are purpose-built for teaching, and uh, they are few and far between. Um, but one of the other reasons why video games aren't adopted a lot in classrooms is because of one reason that's very highly cited amongst educators is that there's no available, uh, commercially available, off-the-shelf video game that you can just use for your discipline. I mean, think of all the different disciplines that are taught here at this university. There's not one single video game that can fill all of those niches. So being able to approach this very large industry as an educator and trying to pick out the right video game can be very, very challenging and is quite often a barrier of entry for a lot of folks. So uh, that brings me to Minecraft. Let me talk a little bit about Minecraft. Minecraft was uh, uh, released initially in 2011, so it's a little over a decade old now. And it is the best-selling game of all time. I don't know how you can say that any differently. Um, one game that has sold the most copies of itself is Minecraft in that span of time. Uh, it's in the top 10 list of the best-selling franchise because now there's different flavors of Minecraft. Um, and this is just staggering. There were over 170 million active players in the last month. I mean, it's, it's hard to understate how significant that is. That's like 2% of the world population is playing this game in the last 30 days. So there are a lot of people who play Minecraft, a lot of people who buy Minecraft, and Minecraft is just a single game. So we're talking about one game out of that very large industry that I, uh, I showed earlier. How many people in here played Minecraft? Curious. Yeah, you don't have to be shy. You don't have to be shy. Yeah, okay. A few, that's good. So uh, for those uninitiated, uh, Minecraft is a voxel-based video game, meaning 
Voxels are just 3D pixels. So they're little cube worlds, cubic worlds. Um, so everything is blocky. That's kind of the style of the video game. It's also important for the mechanics and physics of it. Um, you can play Minecraft in either uh, survival or creative mode. So you can have like a storyline to it and go out and survive and craft and build things and that kind of stuff. But this creative mode is actually also wildly popular. People can just basically have access to all the tools, all the blocks of the game without the constraints of the survival mode and make whatever they want. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but the other cool thing about Minecraft is that you can mod it. So people can add their own flavor, their own signature. They can create new little games or features in the game, tools, textures, all kinds of stuff that, 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 that people can add. So it's also uh, an excellent example of a game that has developed a very active modding uh, community. So in that creative mode, um, people have really gone crazy with what they've tried to do. There is a very popular Minecraft server called Geocraft that's hosted in the Netherlands. And their aim is to basically create a digital twin of the Netherlands in Minecraft. So this is an example of a small little piece of that in the city of Rotterdam. Um, more close to home, closer to home, we have uh, folks here at UBC who are actively creating digital twins of buildings. Uh, this is the McLeod building here at UBC. Both of these images are from, uh, from Minecraft. And uh, there's also a very active community here in Minecraft uh, of students who play Minecraft and just get together and build these digital twins. So they're currently working on a campus layout of the UBC Vancouver campus. You can probably recognize some of the streets and the layout of the buildings. Here's IK Barber uh, showing the, the Ladner clock tower uh, there on the right. So this is sort of where this gaming world uh, crossed into my own profession because I teach geomatics. So I teach everything about being able to map stuff in, in the digital world, being able to visualize it and analyze it and all that kind of stuff. So maybe it wasn't too surprising that this would eventually cross into what I do. Um, I was inspired by a paper that I'd found a number of years ago, um, Anderson et al. in 2017, showed how you could basically take a 3D point cloud from a uh, LIDAR laser scan and convert it into a Minecraft world. Um, basically, uh, these 3D point clouds are classified so you know what's vegetation, what's building, what's ground, and things like that. And then it simply becomes a translation of turning that point cloud into these cubic voxels to make the world. Um, and I thought that was just the neatest thing. And for a lot of years, I just sort of showed my students, this is a really cool example of how to visualize LiDAR. Um, so I thought I would give this a try, but I didn't want to do it in Minecraft because Minecraft is proprietary. You have to be able to have a license to be able to use it and play it. Um, so I looked for alternatives and I landed on um, the game called Mindtest. And Mindtest isn't really a game. Uh, it's more of a game engine. So it, it supports the ability to have other games built into it. Um, it is uh, basically a clone of Minecraft, of sort of all the physics and kind of the gameplay that you expect from Minecraft with two significant differences. Uh, the first being that it's free and open source software. So you're free to change it. You're free to license it. You don't have to pay for it. Um, it's uh, the other reason, the other way that it's very different from Minecraft is that it's this game engine. So it doesn't suppose or presuppose any type of gameplay necessarily. And people have made all kinds of little sub games in it, like Tetris and Pac-Man and other kinds of little mini games like that in this sort of voxelized world. Um, other, other than that, it's the same as Minecraft. You can, you can mod it, you can play online. Um, and it's a pretty active, as far as mine clone, uh, Minecraft clones go, uh, it's probably the most popular out there beyond Minecraft itself. So I started to play around with using this. And, um, this animation here on the left is showing one point clouds that we work with. Uh, this is actually a point cloud from Map Research Forest. Um, just to kind of demonstrate, this is a little cup in this, the forest. Uh, so you, all the gray and the brown is where the ground is, where there's no trees or vegetation. Um, the sort of above the ground that's kind of floating, those are some trees. So inside the block is just some standing live trees that they've left as part of their harvest. Uh, and then there's some forest upslope and downslope of this area. I, I won't get into the technical details about how to do all this, but you usually imagine that we, we take the volume of space that's in point cloud and we compartmentalize it into little one meter cubic blocks. 
And then we basically decide, uh, depending on which type of point is in that block, uh, what kind of shear we're going to give it. So you might have a uh, different texture depending on the elevation profile, whether you're on the top of the terrain or you're somewhere low or deep. Uh, maybe you're at this, you're near sea level, it gets sand and you have water, you know, at, at sea level. Or this big rules-based uh, decision about how to color and characterize the world. And so I started doing this and the image here on the left is my first attempt at that. It wasn't really that inspiring. And after some trial and error and some tweaking, I finally arrived at what you see on the right, which looks more like what the block would look like if you're actually standing there. You can see the tree, uh, tree canopy. There's tree stems that are added. Um, you can probably, you can kind of make out maybe on the upslope and the downslope, the other parts of the forest there. So this is sort of where I ended up. And I thought this was really cool and I'm gonna try and teach you with this. So I started to think about how I could actually do that. Um, I got really crazy with it and started doing any LIDAR data set I could get my hands on. So I, I found all the data here at UBC. Um, here's an example from UBC Rec Beach, kind of sh again, showing that, that elevation profile with you know, the tree canopy on top of it. Um, here's another example from uh, downtown Vancouver. Vancouver has up-to-date LIDAR as well. Uh, so this is an example showing how we can also use buildings if there are buildings that they're classified in the LIDAR data set. Uh, we can show those as well. And where we have other geospatial data like roads or fire hydrants or anything you can imagine, we can put those into these digital twins as well programmatically. So this is very different from like placing blocks by hand uh, for the entire campus and doing it programmatically um, using all the available geospatial data that we have. So I started to think about how to actually do this in my classroom. And um, I wanna just reflect a little bit on how, what are the best practices for working with a video game in a classroom? Um, it shouldn't be mysterious. Uh, video game pedagogy isn't unlike any other uh, teaching approach that you might take in your own classrooms. Um, you have to give some thought as to what you're going to do uh, before you have students play the game. So that might involve lecturing, doing handouts, other kinds of assignments that lead up to it. But in particular with video games, you might also need to teach people how to play them, like how to control the player move around, jump, all that kind of stuff that takes time. Um, during the actual game, you are gonna be focusing on probably scaffolding the content so that the video game play itself isn't necessarily the ends, it's the means of the ends of some broader learning objective or lesson. And that probably involves some problem solving by on the part of students, um, will certainly involve a lot of your time as an instructor or TA doing classroom management again, are things that you're probably already doing when you're teaching in person um, outside of virtual reality, passing out handouts or putting people into groups or whatever you're doing. Um, but very importantly, what this, uh, this review showed that very few people actually do in the literature is the third step, which is to debrief, uh, which is to basically reserve some time and space to talk about what just happened to help to scaffold all of that learning onto the broader course objectives, to provide time to discuss and reflect and ultimately integrates that learning experience with everything else that you're doing in the classroom. So um, what I did, uh, let's, let me take you back one year. Who was teaching in here uh, one year ago, back in January, one year ago? Yes. Does anybody, can anybody remind us what happened back in January last year? Classes were canceled suddenly, yes. Well, not canceled, but they were moved online. Yeah, so we were supposed to be teaching on, uh, in person in January, COVID cases explode, vaccinations aren't there yet. So UBC makes the decision to move everybody back online suddenly after a long time of already teaching online. Um, so it was a bit disappointing, but uh, I found this as kind of an opportunity because I was playing around with these digital worlds like December, November, and had them built. And I thought, I'm already gonna be teaching about this anyway in January in my class. We're going to be online anyway, so let's let's try this out. So I basically took those digital twins that I just showed you. Uh, those are data sets that they were going to be using anyway in their labs, and so uh, they would have they would eventually have experience looking at those data. And I started to build those digital twins, set them up, and basically set up this uh, this classroom um, online. So basically, students were assigned a paper. Um, I, that they were going to read anyway as part of the class. They posted a discussion reaction to that on a board on Canvas. 
And um, basically ahead of the class or ahead of the gameplay, we talked about like digital literacy, gaming etiquette, um, the rules of interacting in the virtual reality. Um, and then we had a, uh, I had to have a backup plan in case, you know, things went south. Um, so that's sort of how this was all set up in the pre-gaming stage. The actual uh, learning experience, again, this was all online and remote. Um, so students had to basically connect to a server where these digital twins were hosted. And um, basically students just learned how to move and fly and chat. And I asked them just to kind of explore the digital twin, which were data that they were already going to be looking at in lab. I explained as they were doing all of this, which takes time, uh, how the digital twins were created. We talked about LIDAR, all the geomatics kind of technical stuff things. And uh, then I had them very, very simple task of just, you know, go find some specific features in the terrain. I was teaching about terrain modeling and different terrain features. You know, go find a peak, uh, go find a slope, uh, go find a slope of this aspect and that kind of thing. And then uh, I had students placed into breakout rooms. Again, reminding that we're in Zoom. So I put them into breakout rooms and uh, basically they were able to unmute themselves and communicate with each other, find each other in the digital twin and go and do tasks of observing and basically inside the canopy, under the canopy, uh, in the cup lock and, and so on so forth. So then at the end of the session, uh, basically I had the whole class just sort of discuss what observations they made. And they made, you know, a lot of really good observations, many of which I hoped that they would make that, you know, it's darker under the forest. There's kind of the edge effects. Uh, there's some parts of the forest that clearly have understory and other parts that don't. And what that looks like in the LIDAR. Um, as well as looking at what the terrain looks like under the forest versus out in the cup lock and those kinds of things. And uh, we teleported to those specific sites and kind of examined them as a class and kind of looked at them. Um, and then I just sort of helped to scaffold some of that content by asking them to reflect on basically what they were observing with uh, the reading that they had just uh, made a reaction to um, before the class. So this all worked really well. I mean, it was awesome. There were technical issues. Um, so what were some of the lessons learned? Uh, well, first, bring a TA. Don't attempt this uh, by yourself as I did. Um, give students tasks, give them something to do, and, and don't be too ambitious with those tasks because things take time, especially if you're doing it remotely as I did. Um, students being able to connect to the server, for example, was, uh, was uh, a challenge. Um, the post-game discussion that I mentioned is really important. Uh, so being able to scaffold what you uh, are learning and the experiences that the students are having in the game with what they're reading or you're talking about or lecturing about is really, really critical. And finally, servers crash. Um, the server crashed a couple of times, but that wasn't that big of a deal. We were able to get back online and everybody was able to see each other again. So um, those are my, that was my experience about a year ago. And since then, um, I embarked on a small tally up with uh, Michelle Zhang, Dominic uh, Roser, and uh, Jenny Hang. And we were awarded a small TLF, TLF to basically build out this idea of um, creating a purpose built game in Mind Test for teaching and learning. So, uh, this is something that we have built that was never, never existed before. So, somehow I kind of became a, a video game developer. Um, but basically, what this, uh, what this game sort of does is it gives you all the functionality that you would hope to have as an educator in a virtual reality space like Minecraft or Mindtest. Um, so being able to manage classrooms, create classrooms, virtual classrooms, uh, being able to manage students, all aspects of that, as you can imagine. Um, being able to record tutorials or have them do tasks and complete those things, other gamified elements related to that. Um, the ability to integrate other mods, I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that what we developed would integrate other stuff that other people have developed for MindTest um, without the need to like rewrite it. Um, and other things that, that are more related to just being able to have a server manage it and to be able to uh, have uh, students get, have, have some tools that are specifically for uh, teaching forestry. Um, so some of the, I'm just going to kind of walk through some of the different features of this. And uh, one of those, as I mentioned, is this classroom generator. So basically you can, uh, you can create random worlds. You can choose any random number and set a sea level and 
explore or generate different sizes, all kinds of different dimensions, whatever you want, uh, different types of terrain. Um, it'll generate all kinds of different stuff for you. Uh, and that's really cool if you just want a random world to walk around in. Um, we, there's also support to add in biomes. So you can choose from any kind of biome and all the major biomes in the world, uh, forested biomes, uh, different forested biomes, uh, deserts, grasslands, tundra, oceans, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you can basically keep the terrain as it is and just decorate with whatever biome you want your students to explore in. Uh, eventually, we're going to have uh, biogeochromatic zones, um, back zones uh, that will be imported as well. So you can choose the back zones you pick from. Um, one of the other cool things is that you can change the sea level. So if you have some terrain or you have whatever you, you're looking at, you can simulate flooding, you can simulate sea level rise, uh, you can visualize this in real time so you can change it. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff that you can do, you know, related to teaching hydrology, teaching about terrain, uh, water flow, runoff, um, those kinds of concepts. Visualizing something like climate change uh, vulnerability is another aspect uh, that you could probably achieve with this. And then there is support for all that digital twin stuff that I'd mentioned earlier. So um, in addition to creating random worlds, which is fun, you can also uh, basically import all kinds of real world data and create your own digital twins. So basically all the digital twins I showed you can also be created as these sort of classrooms uh, that are self-contained that students can't leave and, and so forth. Um, you can add all kinds of different data to those roads, buildings, anything that you can map, you can basically use in this digital twin uh, creator. And uh, you know, the process is basically just what I showed you earlier with in the Malcolm Map Research Forest. Um, beyond the, the actual world building, we've added a bunch of tools and, and things for, you know, just be able to have it used as a classroom. Um, so having like a student notebook, like basically a little tool that every player gets when they join uh, to be able to move around to different classrooms, to find each other, to personalize their avatar or experience, as you can imagine, is very, very important in a video game. Um, reporting issues, getting help, uh, things like that. You can also take spatial notes. So if you find something in a particular uh, classroom or a world, and you wanna record it, you can do that. Uh, and reporting issues and getting help and, and stuff like this are all kind of built into this notebook tool. Um, one of the other cool things about the digital twins is that because they are built on real world geospatial data, they have real world coordinates that are associated with them. And we can simulate this actually in the, uh, the actual digital twins themselves. When you're in the game, this uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, it can display basically what your latitude, longitude is, what your elevation is, and all that kind of stuff. So you can almost imagine you could use this to also explore, just explore real-world data and look at things uh, at a very granular level. Um, we also set out to create a bunch of tools um, that are currently being used in our field schools and taught at field schools. Um, to replicate them in mind tests so that we could have students be able to practice using them in, in this virtual reality. Um, so we picked a bunch of tools and I basically brought all these tools um, to the student developers that were working on creating these because they are not forestry students and they had to like inspect them and look at them and learn how to use them uh, to replicate some of the stuff that, that, uh, that happens uh, when, they, when you use the tools. So if you use some of the compasses we have here in forestry, this is kind of our take on that, where you know, it has a little flipping action, it has a mirror. You can change uh, the mag magnetic declination. Uh, you could simulate that, you know what that means. You can also adjust your azimuth. You can uh, put red in the shed, it's all magnetic. It points to real geographic north in the digital twin if you're in a digital twin. Um, so in all, uh, all, for all purposes, it, it, it acts like a real compass and you could, uh, basically set up a classroom and have a bunch of waypoints and have students move around and practice uh, doing that kind of orienteering, uh, which is really fun. One of the other tools we uh, developed was just a simple measuring tape, uh, being able to lay out a transect or measure distances between two points um, was uh, really important. Uh, students use measuring tapes in, uh, in the field anyway. And uh, yeah, you can measure distances from different objects or um, distances, uh, again, on the ground, those kinds of things um, are often things that we're doing or that students are doing out in the field anyway. 
Um, we also uh, created a clinometer, you know, an old school clinometer that you can basically simulate what you're seeing through that little viewfinder with your right eye. Uh, as you move up and down with the clinometer, uh, it changes the measure of degrees or percentage of inclination or slope. Um, so you can practice your trigonometry skills if you want. They're really old school that way. Um, but one of the cooler tools we had uh, created was a rangefinder. So um, it, has anybody used the rangefinders during forestry? Okay, so you might know what I'm what I'm talking about with all these different measurements you can make. But basically, we have this tool that you can uh, measure inclination, you can measure heights of stuff, you can measure azimuths, like with a compass, um, slope distance, horizontal distance, uh, missing line, like just measuring the distance between two points that you can that you can see. So a rangefinder is this little um, laser uh, measuring device that, that shoots a laser that measures the distance to things. And using very fancy trigonometry, you can make all these different measurements in, in 3D, uh, which is really cool. And students use these uh, in the field. They practice using them. They practice learning about all these concepts. Um, so that was sort of our, our motivation for creating these, this, these particular tools. Um, one of the other tools that we created in collaboration with uh, the UBC Botanical Garden uh, was this little magnifying tool that you can basically use to go around and click on different plants uh, in the world that you're in, and it will display information about that species. Um, so as an example, it'll show you uh, a little blurb about the species. You can see some images. Um, you can learn about the, uh, the taxonomy of the species. Um, you can also find it if you're looking for it. It'll sparkle in the world if you're trying to find where the nearest one is. Um, there's some gamified elements to this as well, where we've added this uh, ability to basically um, favorite or sort of find uh, all these different species. So you can go around collecting them and finding all the different species you can. Um, there's a study mode where you can turn off the taxonomic information and practice learning the taxonomic information, the, the genus, family, and so forth. Um, and so this is something that we're still developing with the Botanical Garden and their collections, uh, developing all these collections and, and uh, textures and, and things that we need to make this, uh, this work. Uh, and then one of the other features that we have for the, the actual MindFest classroom game that we've developed is this tutorial system, where basically as, a, as an instructor, you can record anything like your player movement or the tool that you're holding or your position or what you're looking at or where you're looking, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can basically record it as a tutorial or a sequence of like actions that the student has to replicate in order to pass the level or you know, achieve something. And basically this is uh, just basically allows you to give students uh, rewards. You can give them privileges. Uh, they can complete tutorials in sequence. It's kind of like completing different less, uh, levels uh, of a game. Um, it can be gamified, if, you know, however you want to set that up, uh, but we don't presuppose too much on that. So it's really just kind of the framework for being able to do this in a game like MindTest. Um, future work. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of it. <laughs> uh, we've kind of been exploring how to use this as a just a data visualization tool, um, as well as a decision support tool. So Imagine being able to see uh, campus and campus community planning might want to put in a new building and see what the impact on the shadowing or uh, the visual aspects of that might be. That's totally possible with uh, this. Uh, we're also looking at and working on developing this forest simulator so you can sort of generate a forest of whatever type, age, stand, composition, et cetera, um, and create a forest that way as opposed to using a digital twin approach. I mentioned that we're working on adding VEC zones. Um, we are also thinking about utilizing this very ambitious and um, large community of Minecraft players on campus who are willing to de dedicate and volunteer their time to actually place little details in worlds. Um, so we're hoping to have a digital twin of campus that would have all the geospatial data sort of programmatically create that but then crowdsource all sort of the little finer details of putting in little trees and, and lamp posts and all that other kind of stuff that might not necessarily be mapped. Um, there's the possibility of being able to manipulate the digital twins, as I mentioned, really in any way that you want. Uh, you want to burn the forest down, you can do that. You can put a building in, you can cut it, you can apply all kinds of different management options, uh, designs. We're also um, 
working on creating different walking tours once the digital twins are created. So things uh, like being able to navigate or tour the botanical garden, uh, Malcolm Knapp Research Forest, Alex Frazier Research Forest, really anywhere that you have LIDAR data. <clears throat> Um, but beyond this project, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of actual research because very, very few studies have done any kind of randomized controlled trials. So a lot of the research that I showed you uh, at the beginning is mostly observational. It's mostly survey based and it shows a lot of impact in terms of uh, creating a positive learning environment on the part of video games in the classroom. Um, but there's not really a lot of research that uh, does the hard work of looking at you know, what's, what's the magnitude of that difference compared with other pedagogies or what's the effectiveness of it compared with other approaches. Um, in my view, we also need to increase digital literacy. And this is actually uh, something that uh, BC Campus, which is uh, open educational resource arm of the Ministry of Education here in BC, they're undertaking uh, efforts to collate and collect all kinds of new uh, open educational resources for teaching about digital literacy. Because I, I think that not many of us get a lot of formal training and experience with like interacting with each other in virtual worlds or online. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, safety and security issues that come along with that that we often don't think about and certainly our students aren't thinking about it necessarily. Um, and then finally, I do, I do want to just conclude by saying that video game pedagogy is not a panacea. Um, it, it, just like any other pedagogy, it's, uh, it's a tool. Um, and as an educator, you have the option of choosing which tool you're going to apply in a given situation. So you can almost think of it as, uh, you know, you wouldn't try to engineer a building with the expectation that you're just going to use a screwdriver or a hammer. Um, it takes a lot of different things and a lot of different tools to use. And certainly even in my own teaching, there's only a couple of cases where I, you know, would actually use this to teach a particular concept. And I still appreciate hands drawn maps and all kinds of different approaches to teaching what I teach. Um, so I certainly don't want to impart onto you that this is the only way to do things or that it's the best way in all cases, because it's not. Um, with that, if you want to get involved, we have a very active GitHub uh, with all kinds of mods that we're talking about. And you can also play the server if you'd like. Um, and I don't know if many people in here have computers, but you can join the server. We do have a UBC hosted server that has an example of what the current digital twin looks like. Um, and I'll come back to the slide in case you want to copy that down. Uh, I do want to acknowledge all the other folks who've worked on this. I mentioned my uh, collaborators, uh, Dominic, Michelle, and, and Ginny, but we also hired a whole bunch of uh, fantastic undergraduates over the summer um, to help create a whole of this. Uh, a number of game developers, pixel artists, uh, user interface experience, uh, designer, and a 3D artist, 3D modeler. Um, so I just want to acknowledge all of the fantastic work that students have done together in collaboration with the Emerging Media Lab. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Good question, right? That was fantastic. What a, what a high bar you set for the next oh, thank uh, event. You. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, we have time for questions. So if anyone is interested, we will be circulating the mic. Thanks for the good talk, Paul. Um, I had a question um, relevant to like exploring the uh, different uh, tree types and stuff like that. Is there like also like catalogs of tree types within there? So say I wanted to be in study mode and I would just like kind of like, is there a way to disseminate the information out of the geospatial world into like a solidified? Age? Yes, yes. Um... So I didn't have an image of it, but there, in addition to the tool itself, there's a compendium, what we call a compendium that you can basically add all the species that you want with all the information that you need, like the images, the text, and everything that gets populated in the view. Um, so you can actually interact with the compendium. You can filter it, sort it by Pinus or Picea or whatever. Um, and you can find species that way. You can look at them that way without actually having to find them in the world as well. So yeah, um, yeah, that's... Totally possible. One of the biggest challenges with it is just collating the information in a way that can be uh, added into the game. Uh, because mine tests in Minecraft itself, they don't come with a lot of like, the default set of species is very limited um, and certainly not enough to actually teach, you know, the important ecological concepts that we have and teach about in the different forest types and stuff like that. Um. 
Um, thank you so much for your great talk. Um, so I, I've heard that gamification is also used in hiring employees and recruitment. So I was wondering if you, which basically makes it an assessment tool. So I was wondering, instead of teaching with this game in your classes, have you ever thought of using it as an exam or in the assessment process of students or anything like that? Do you think it's if it's possible based on the challenges that you mentioned? Yeah, um, that's a very that's a very good question. I personally have not, um, but I could definitely see the value of it in those situations. Uh, the challenge to date has just been having like being able to create a way for lots of students to get into the same multiplayer server, basically mod, change it, destroy it, do whatever they want to it. Um, adding in uh, assessment on top of that is going to take some more thinking as to how we might manipulate our framework for it. Um, but you could absolutely. I mean, even like the tutorial system that I'd mentioned, you can use that to gamify any elements of the world. So if you have students, uh, you want students to be able to know how to do something uh, in a particular order or a sequence of events or something like this, um, you know, like being able to learn how to use a compass, for example, uh, they could get to the right answer by arriving at the right location in the 3D space, the 3D world. So you could do that with the, the current tutorial system and then give them a reward or an item or a skin or an avatar or whatever they want uh, out of it, I guess. So it could be used as assessment uh, in, that, in that sense. Yeah. Hey, thanks for that talk. That was super interesting. And I love the idea of trying to, you know, immerse students out in the field in different ways. Um, I wonder if you can speak a bit more to your experience and maybe what you've read in the literature on what the sort of barriers to entry for this type of teaching are, because with video games of this type, you've got to, you know, take yourself as a person and immerse yourself with an avatar and understand yourself in that new space. And that might be a barrier for some people there. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, speak to the challenges that you see and maybe, uh, you know, some of your own experience. Yes. Um, so, uh, the access to it was one of the one of the biggest driving driving motivations for why I chose mind test in particular, because I didn't want that to be a, one of the, the access barriers. Um, I, I didn't want to do it in Minecraft only because uh, here at UBC, we actually have a Minecraft uh, license for the education edition as an example. Um, it's just part of the whole Microsoft ecosystem that we all share from, uh, from our CWLs. Uh, but I wanted this to be accessible beyond our institution. Um, so that barrier of access was one, but others that I kind of noticed anecdotally, you know, uh, a lot of people play video games, but not everybody knows how to play this video game. So, uh, you know, it took a long, one of the learning, I guess, le lessons learned on my end is, you know, the time that it requires to be able to train students how to just move around and learn how to chat or whatever, to be able to use the game in the way that you expect them to it can probably take longer than you might expect. Um, there's not a lot that's special about my, the Minecraft gameplay that's different from maybe what other people might have played before in terms of how you move around and interact. But that could be a consideration certainly for other games, different types of games that don't use that those keys and that gameplay in particular. Um, yeah, so those are some that, that kind of come to mind from my experience. Thanks for your great talk. So my question is, so what levels of uh, modeling or programming skills are required for like modeling this game? Um, so you, the, yeah, the question was about what level of skill do you need for modding the game um, in terms of programming? I mean, if you know Python, you could, I mean, really any language that has some syntax, you understand how to use it. Um, the only challenge with it is that mind test is written in Lua. How many people in here have used Lua before? Okay, two people. <laughs> so yeah, that that's one of the what's one of the barriers of entry to being able to mod it. So Lua is kind of an obscure language, but it's not really all that different from other object-oriented languages. Um, so you could pick it up. I, I mean, I've learned enough to be able to get by. It's not my first language by by any means, but um, there's a very active community uh, in modding, and uh, because it's you know free and open source software, people are willing to share and help uh, each other. And, you know, outside of Minecraft itself, it's probably the next biggest community in terms of modding um, with Lua. 
So yeah, that I would say you could probably, if you dedicated yourself to it, you could you could open up you know some of the scripts and learn how to how they work and how to do different things. I have another question. Yeah. So is it possible to load other types of like voxel based data into this software? Like we're dealing with like CT scans like data, which are like voxel based, like cross section, cross section images of wood. So is it mm. possible to load this yeah. kind of thing? Yes. Uh, yeah. So it is. Um, any kind of voxelized data can be loaded in. Um, the rub is that the scale at which you perceive it as the player in the game, the default scale is a one meter by one meter block. So if you were going to load in like a, a scan of some wood fibers or whatever you're, you're looking at, that might be at a much, much higher resolution. Um, you would have to kind of divorce yourself from the player perspective that you have in the game and recognize the scale difference. So I've kind of explored with that. You can create different voxel sizes if you want to. Uh, that becomes more challenging. So it really just becomes a scale kind of perception issue. But you could certainly use it to load in and then just kind of you know pan around and zoom around and explore the data. Um, that's kind of how I've been using it for just like exploring LiDAR, voxelized LiDAR data. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. My question may uh, be my ignorance. Uh, uh, regarding the name that was chosen for the tool that is uh, developed, uh, you chose the name video games. And when I hear the name of video game, I think of uh, a game, a play that people would uh, play against each other, a competition, or even they score with the uh, they, uh, they have a game that they play with the computer. Uh, here, uh, I see a digital tool that's used for exploration and learning uh, of the terrain. And uh, you are using, in my view, a digital tool. Uh, I'm asking why the name is video game. Yeah, no, that's, a, that is, that's a good point. So um, the 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 tool itself, I guess, is a video game. So that, that, I guess that would be my first argument. But there are um, some elements of the gameplay that we are trying to gamify. So I think kind of what you're describing is like a point system or badges or moving on to levels and getting rewards and this kind of thing. Um, that sort of broadly falls under gamification, which isn't necessarily for video games exclusively. You can think of like board games or any other kind of activity you might do in your classroom. Um, so we are trying to add more of those elements into this. Uh, uh, we're not quite there yet, but we did want to not try to presuppose too much about what people might use it for. Um, and on the back end, kind of designing something that's very specific for what we do here at UBC or what I do, uh, and just making it more widely applicable. Um, so the tutorial system, for example, is one aspect of creating levels and rewards and stuff like that. We do have plans to add, you know, some sort of point-based system or being able to unlock badges, add flair, like those kinds of things that sort of add that gameplay motivation, setting up teams or organizing students into teams and that kind of work um, is certainly forthcoming. So we haven't lost sight of it. Uh, we, in this initial stage, have just tried to develop something that could be used in, in the classroom for kind of what, what I view are some of the challenges for teaching with uh, a video game, you know, from an educator's perspective. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I was just wonder, wondering in the lecture you gave last year using this tool, what kind of feedback you got from your students in the discussion, if you felt there was a higher engagement and also if you had a test in the end or an assignment, you could see that just the things they learned in there stuck better in their mind afterwards. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so in terms of looking at, I guess, how uh, if Effective it's been, that's something that I'm looking at deploying this year um, ahead of the field schools or some of the field schools anyway, being able to give students access to it to be able to practice using the forestry tools. Um, we haven't had, we, we did some user testing as part of the game development and had students come, basically come in and practice using the tools and, and kind of get feedback as to like how intuitive it was to control the tools, to use the compass, for example. Um, and we made adjustments sort of technically around those, those different aspects. Um, but as far as 
using it in terms of evaluation or as an assignment, I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, I've, uh, I've definitely been using it mostly as a way to visualize and get students into the scale of the data that they don't normally experience. So that's kind of been, um, I think the biggest reaction from students is that when you're you know, working on GIS software, ArcGIS or something, you're really zoomed out. You're not, you can't see any, any individual pixel, but then you get thrown into it and suddenly you recognize there's a lot of variation at this really granular scale that you don't normally perceive. Um, so that's kind of been an interesting observation, but I haven't, I haven't really tested it or looked at it beyond that. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, it was really interesting. Um, one thing that I want to note about video games is that so many, it's changed a lot over the years. So like a lot of video games now are just for people to explore and look around and experience things that maybe they wouldn't normally experience. But you mentioned augmented reality at one point. I don't. Um, have you considered using something like that to help increase? So you say like walking through, right? So you're walking through it, you know, and you're on your phone or your device. But um, there's a lot of things that develop from like Niantic, so like Pokemon Go mm -hmm. and whatnot yep. that have already mapped so much of campus, for example, that mm -hmm. have that information, you know, every totem pole is in it or something like that. Um, have you figured out a way to incorporate that? Yes, um, actually, we've been given a oh, lot of thoughts to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, one of the things I didn't present that I've been working on is being able to incorporate OpenStreetMap into it. Um, so open, if you don't know OpenStreetMap, it's a crowdsource volunteer geographic information. People walk around with their phones or devices and they tag real world things um, and they get uploaded into this massive server that contains all this data around the world. Um, so it's a huge cache of geospatial data. That includes very granular things like lampposts and benches and stuff that we would need to build a digital twin. Um, so in addition to that, we've been thinking about how to incorporate that into our crowdsourcing idea of campus to be able to have basically people, uh, anybody who wants to volunteer their time to go around and like tag things in the digital twin uh, as a suggestion as to what this feature is or to add attributes to it, that kind of thing. Um, we've also talked uh, with the Botanical Garden about the possibility of doing something similar in the garden. They have a lot of other um, volunteer-based projects, science projects. They're uh, like the flora, um, the bird one, but there's, there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time tagging species and birds and things like this and observations. So we're trying to figure out a way of how we can incorporate that into a visualization in the digital twin. So not just creating a, trying to create the digital twin itself, but trying to augment it in a way that you can visualize other data on top of it. Um, yeah, and so those are some examples of that. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, uh so it's just not really a question. I just kind of want to share my thoughts. So I feel like um, this tool or like this game is really good for, you know, if there's any kind of um, landscape ecology classes offered in both undergraduate or graduate level. Because um, I guess from my personal experience, like landscape ecology, you know, when we learn and we deal with lots of like rasterized or like pixelated data. So which is pretty much this, except it's like non-interactive and 2D. Um, so sometimes like for us to understand the series, like how different landscape metrics calculate it. Mm. Um, at like a grid and trying to figure it out like how different this works. Yeah. Yeah, no, th thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, that's been something that we've considered a lot about or that that's the way I've been primarily teaching with it in terms of the raster based data. Uh, just having students be able to explore at a local level, the difference in elevation and how that impacts how the slope is calculated at a particular location. Um, so yeah, those, uh, what you just described about the landscape ecology metrics, I think would be really, really cool to augment it or show it in some way. Right. 
Uh, maybe another question about uh, next steps. You mentioned that there's, a, you know, an ability to build um, based on any sort of data input that we have geographically. Um, but in terms of rollout, like how close would we be to be able to do, say, before and after type of simulations? You know, say there a wildfire went through, or there was a flood, or or whatever uh, situation you want to show in a lab. How close is that? Um, I would say pretty close. Uh, fire is actually something that's already uh, a mechanic in physics of the game, as an example. Um, whether or not it actually behaves as we understand fire to behave is another matter, um, but that that does exist. It's very close to being used in that way if you wanted to. Uh, in terms of simulation, other kind of any kind of before or after doing this management decision or changing something. I mean, if you have the digital twin, you can manipulate it, save it, create a new classroom with the manipulate. Like you can move between different versions of the digital twin um, or just update it in real time. So. Those are, yeah, we're very, very close to being able to do that. If you can already do that with the geographic data, you can manipulate them in a way that can produce the different digital twins that you want to see, then that's that's a reality. But actually doing it in game is sort of the next <laughs> the next hurdle of being able to trigger a wildfire in the game and and you know have all the mechanics work uh, as you expect them is uh, is a bit further off. Of it. Do you have a March 14th or a 9th?